Well, last week we enjoyed our first slice of humble pie. Do you remember? Tonight we're going to savor another slice of this ultimate slimming food that is guaranteed to cut us down to size. And uh, this has been uh, a humbling experience for me preparing. And I just know that the Lord really has his plan in the fact that we are dealing with this subject at this time, at least in my life. And so I thank him for it. Now we saw last week that Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 6, which is the passage we're looking at, is a parallel passage to Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. Do you remember those verses? Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united to Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any tenderness, and, if any fellowship with the Spirit, and if any tenderness and compassion, Paul says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. And then he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look out not just for your own interests, but also the interests of others. Now we've seen that that's what Paul is calling us to in Philippians chapter 2. Now in Ephesians chapter 4, we have what that looks like. What qualities will be in, our, in my life if I am like Paul is calling me to be in Philippians chapter 2. Are you with me? Okay. So we saw that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, and maybe we can read those verses together. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, my Bible says, beseech you, is calling earnestly for this, that you have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness. That's literally what it says, but remember the word is in humility, or with all humility, meekness or gentleness, with patience or long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, and then endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In those verses, we have five characteristics of a worthy walk. Humility, meekness or gentleness, patience or long-suffering, love and unity. Now, we saw last time that those are similar to each other, but also very different. And that there is a very definite progression in those characteristics. So, humility will lead to meekness. And meekness will lead to patience. And patience will then lead to love or forbearing in love. And that will finally then lead to unity, which is the whole goal that Paul highlights for us there in Philippians chapter 2. And I remind you again that humility or literally lowliness of mind is the all-encompassing grace from which all the other characteristics flow. And that's why we spent last week the whole Bible study looking at what humility is. But because it's so important and because it's the overarching grace, I want us to just refresh our memories a little bit about what we mean by humility again this evening. So let's just start again by reminding ourselves of what the essence of humility is. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11 says, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. When God created the universe, and more particularly when he created man, what was his main objective? Why were we created? For what purpose do we exist? Wonderful. You're all very good Presbyterians tonight. Remember the shorter catechism? What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And the two go together. It is as we glorify God that we will have joy. God made us to display His glory in and through us. We were made in His image to reflect his glory. <coughs> um, the same way that a mirror would reflect, say, the, the light of the sun. We were not made to display our own glory. 
We were made to be instruments or tools in God's hand through which he could display his glory. <coughs> Excuse me. I thought of another illustration of this, and that would be this projector that we're using here this evening to display what is on my laptop. The projector is just a tool. The projector doesn't have the glory. It doesn't have the content. It's just an instrument or a channel. The, the laptop is the one that has the content, has the glory. But it is as this projector avails itself to this laptop, connected by Wi-Fi, <clears throat> that the glory is displayed through that projector. And that's really what we are. We are a tool for the display of the glory of God, like a mirror reflecting the sun's rays. God made us. God keeps us alive every moment. And therefore, he owns us. It therefore goes without saying that if he made us, if we're kept alive every moment, and if he owns us, then we are totally dependent on him for everything. Now, <clears throat> I want to quote again this evening from Andrew Murray. Remember, we looked at uh, his, something from his little book on humility. He says, as God is the ever-living, ever-present, present, ever-acting one, who upholds all things by the word of his power and in whom all things exist, the relationship of the creature to God can only be one of unceasing, absolute, universal dependence. There, there is no other way about it. God is the creator, and if he is the one who made us, owns us, keeps us alive every moment, we are totally dependent on him. We owe everything to God. And so our highest virtue and our only happiness, says uh, Andrew Murray, now and through all eternity, is to present ourselves as an empty vessel, as an instrument, as a tool, a channel, through which God can dwell and manifest or display his power and goodness. And we saw that that is the essence of humility. To be totally dependent on God and totally surrendered to God's will for my life. It means being like, remember, clay in God's hands. For him to mold and shape us into any shape he wants in order to display his glory. It is like, do you remember the glove? Okay. The glove on its own cannot do anything. It cannot lift up a bottle. It can't do anything on its own. It is only a tool, a channel. But when it is filled with my hand, the real power, then it can be used to pick up things or to clean things. And we are simply like this glove. We are empty vessels that need to be filled and be available to be used by the power of God, by God himself. Or like the pen. Remember I said, the pen has to obey my will. <laughs> it's, to, it's totally dependent on me. It's just a tool in order for me to write. It, hasn't, it, it can't do its own thing. If it does, we'd have a scribbly mess. I'd be trying to write carol and it would be all over the place and it would look like children's scribbles. So... Humility is seeing yourself as you are in reality. And that was something else we pointed out. It is, this, is, this is the reality, that you are nothing without God. <laughs> Rather than living like most people in the world by the lie that they are something. It is being honest with yourself and thinking of yourself, as Paul says in Romans 12 verse 3, with sober judgment. In other words, with a sane mind. And we saw, the minute you turn away from humility, from this attitude towards pride, like Nebuchadnezzar, you lose your mind. <laughs> you become insane. Now, he's obviously the extreme of that. But the, to have a sane mind is to think of yourself soberly, honestly. And the reality is that before God, we are nothing. We are totally dependent on him. And humility flows not only, remember, just from a sense of shame for sin, 
Although obviously our sin should cause shame and should make us feel humble. But Andrew Murray points out an important thing. That humility flows from a recognition of God's grace to me a sinner as my redeemer and from a realization of my true position before God as my creator. So he's saying that knowing that I'm a sinner isn't, isn't what humbles us most. It is knowing that I'm a sinner redeemed by the grace of God, that I'm only a creature of the creator. That is what humbles most. Listen to him here. Nothing is more natural and beautiful and blessed than to be nothing that God may be all. It is not sin that humbles most, but grace. And it is the soul led through its sinfulness to be occupied with God in His wonderful glory as God, as Creator and as Redeemer, that will truly take the lowest place before Him. If we are indeed to be humble, he goes on to say, not only be before God and towards men, if humility is going to be our joy, then we must see that it is not just a mark of shame because of sin, but apart from all sin, it is being clothed with the very beauty and blessedness of heaven and of Jesus. I've told you last week, humility nowadays, it's a swear word. We think of it as something negative, but it is meant to be something terribly positive. It is being clothed with the very beauty and blessedness of heaven and of Jesus. We shall see that just as Jesus found his glory in taking the form of a servant, Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11, um, just as he found his glory in taking the form of a servant, so when he said to us, whoever would be first among you must be your servant, he was simply teaching us the blessed truth that there is nothing so divine and heavenly as being the servant and the helper of all. The faithful servant who recognizes his position will find pleasure in supplying the needs of the master and of the guests. If you know that's your position, you're a servant in the house and you find joy in that, it will be your pleasure to serve the master and to serve his guests. When we see that humility is something infinitely deeper than just contrition, that is sadness for your sin, grief over your sin, and accept it as a participation in the very life of Jesus, being like Jesus, we shall begin to learn that it is our true nobility and that to prove it, that by that he means to test it for yourself, in being the servants of all, is actually the highest fulfillment of our destiny as people created in the image of God. Why? Because we were made to glorify Him. We were not made to glorify ourselves. And humility is being totally dependent on God. And so being a servant of all fulfills our destiny. Now, just as humility is entire dependence upon God, and it's the root from which all the other graces flow that we, that we will get to tonight. Remember, we also saw that pride, the opposite of it, is a declaration of independence from God. It's saying, I'll do it my way. It's the root from which every other sin and evil grows. And that is, we must be careful of not thinking of pride as just a sort of unattractive temperament or personality quirk. It's just the way I am kind of thing. And you shouldn't just be thinking of humility as a sort of decent thing that, you know, decent people do. We need to understand this is so serious. The one is death. The other is life. The one means hell. The other means heaven. Do you remember what we said last week? The rule of heaven is, thy will be done. The rule of hell is, my will be done. And ultimately, hell is just the place where we ultimately get our own way. Where we get our own way finally. 
And that's what Jesus came to save us from. He came to save us from our pride. And it is what he came to restore us to. To humility. To dependence on God again. To glorifying God. He became man so that he could take our place as our substitute. And fulfill our destiny. What we were created to be. He was the ultimate man who humbled himself completely. He, his was a life of perfect humility, of total dependence on God his Father, of total submission to the Father's will. And it is in this way that his humility, his humble life in our place, is our salvation. He lived the perfect life we can't. And... It is his salvation, what he came to accomplish for us, that ends up being our humility. That leads us again to humility before God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Peace, no, no, I'm, no, right, you're with me. All right, humility is not something, it's not just a something that we bring to God, says Andrew Murray. It's not just something he bestows. Now, what, what he's trying to say is humility doesn't have some kind of existence. There's no such thing as the stuff. Picture the stuff called humility. There isn't such a thing as stuff called humility. Okay. What it is, is just a sense of entire nothingness. It's an attitude, a sense that comes when we see how truly God is all and in which we make way for God to be all. When the creature realizes that this is his true nobility, and he has an important word, and consents to be with his will, his mind, and his affections, the form or the vessel in which the life and glory of God are to work and manifest or display themselves, then he will see that humility is simply acknowledging the truth of his position as a creature and Yielding, another very important word there, yielding to God his place. And that's a very important point that I want to, us to take note of tonight that I didn't point out last week. Because obviously the glove and the clay and the pen which is somewhere down here, they as illustrations fall short, don't they? Because these things don't have a will of their own. They are inanimate objects. But we who are made in the image of God, we have the ability to choose. We have a will. We teach the children in Sunday school that being made in the image of God is this. With a mind to know God, with a heart to love God, and with a will to choose to obey God. That's what makes us different to the glove and the clay and the, and the pen. We have the ability to choose to obey God. And so what I need to point out, and this is so important, is that what we're talking about is willingly choosing to surrender. It is voluntarily giving up the rights to control or run my life. And it involves a glad, wholehearted surrender or submission to the sovereign control and the will of the Creator. That's what God is calling for. That's what Jesus came to restore in us. The ability to do that. To become like clay in the Master's hands. Remember we used the illustration of dancing last week. Ballroom dancing. Ilza, you'll... Be able to tell us because you and Marina's did ballroom dancing at some stage. But you can't have two people leading, can you? If you have two people leading, you have a disaster. One leads and the other follows. And that's what God is saying. I'm the creator. I lead. I lead with love. You need to surrender to that leadership and follow me. So how do we fight for humility? Do you remember what we said? Beholding is becoming. It is as we meditate on the life of Jesus that we will be transformed from one degree of glory into another to become more and more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And remember we said that we need to take up the yoke of Jesus. Come 
to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. And we saw that that yoke is the willing submission of, of Jesus to his Father. And learn from me, says Jesus, because I am gentle and humble in heart. So it is as we look at the humble and gentle Jesus, as we meditate on him, that we will become like what we behold. Just like little children become like their parents when they copy them. Andrew Murray says, let us study the character of Christ until our souls are filled with the love and admiration of his lowliness. And let us believe that when we are broken down under a sense of our pride and our impotence to cast it out, and that's something that these Bible studies have done for me. My goodness, it just shows you again and again just how full of self we are. That great I. And how unable I am in and of myself to kill that I. Well, when I'm in that position, he says, that's the best place to be. Because then Jesus Christ himself will come in to impart this grace as part of his wonderful life within us. As we are broken, as that proud, stiff-necked I is bent. <laughs> Remember we said that as that a C is just a bent eye, that the life of Jesus Christ will be able to, or he'll be able to live his life in and through us. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, who is your master? Whose will is the guiding principle of your life? Is it your thing or is it God's thing? Remember, the rule of heaven is thy will be done. The rule of hell. Anytime we begin to say my will be done, we are doing Satan's will. It's the rule of hell. And hell is ultimately the place where we finally get our own way completely. So, that's just as a reminder of the overarching grace of humility. Now, the other graces of Ephesians 4, 1 to 6 flow out from this. And we're just going to look at two tonight. We'll look at the other two next week. The first of those is meekness or gentleness. What does that mean? Well, you know it's a fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience and kindness, goodness and self-control. Uh, I need to sing the Sunday school song to get all, the, all the, the fruits. But meekness is one of them. And it is a byproduct of humility. The Greek word meekness, proutes, refers to something mild or gentle. Here's a nice definition. Meekness towards God is that disposition of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good, without disputing or resisting. In the Old Testament, the meek are those wholly relying on God rather than their own strength to defend them against injustice. And thus, meekness towards evil people means knowing that God is permitting the injuries that they inflict, that he is using them to purify his elect and that he will deliver his elect in his time. Gentleness or meekness is the opposite of self-assertiveness or self-interest and it stems from trust in God's goodness and control over the situation. And a gentle person is not occupied with self at all. Do you remember what we saw last week from C.S. Lewis? Humility is not so much thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Not being preoccupied with yourself. A meek person is the opposite of someone who's vindictive, someone who harbors bitterness and resentment. Meekness is the characteristic of someone who's opposed to vengeance and violence. It is a quiet, willing, willing, voluntary submission to God and to others. Now, can you see why it is a byproduct of humility? Can you see why it flows from humility? Now, in classical Greek, the word proutes was used to refer of a medicine that calmed and soothed the spirit. It was used of a gentle breeze. 
And it was used of a colt, a horse being tamed, being broken, a wild horse being broken in so that you could use its power and energy for useful purposes. So if you want a short definition of meekness, it is power under control. A meek person is not weak or cowardly. All right, that's something we need to, to understand. A meek person will fight for the right cause. But a meek person has a gentle, pleasant spirit, except when they ought to be angry. So meekness is power under control. Let me illustrate it for you from those illustrations of the way the word was used. It's illustrated by a horse. The Greeks used to call their horse praus or meek. When the horse got to the level of training where it would obey the master or the rider no matter what was going on. If it got to that level of training, then they knew it could be trusted in the heat of battle. Not to do something stupid or foolish. So it, it was a wild horse trained to the point where that horse could be trusted to do exactly what the master or the rider told it to do no matter what the circumstances. And once he could trust the animal to obey him no matter what, he would call it a meek horse. Even though it was a powerful, thoroughbred stallion capable of killing enemies in battle. So do you see, it's not a weak word. It is power but under control. It's illustrated by the wind. When the wind blows with hurricane force, it wreaks havoc. But when there's a quiet, gentle breeze blowing and it catches a windmill, the windmill pumps the water, which waters the crop, which feeds the people. You see, it's power under control. You mustn't think of meekness as being characterized by indifference or cowardice or weakness or fearfulness. Meekness is not powerless or cowardly because Jesus was meek. And he wasn't impotent or cowardly. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 26 actually goes on to say, In your anger do not sin. In other words, anger for the right reason is power under control. In your anger, or be angry, but do not sin. Anger for the wrong reason is power out of control. Aristotle the Greek philosopher, had this very helpful definition of meekness. Meekness is the virtue between indifference, in other words, I don't care about the situation, I couldn't care less, and anger or a short temper. So meekness is in between the extreme of, you know, who cares, whatever, whatever. How do the kids say today? That's just gone out of my head. You guys must help me now. <laughs> it is what it is. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> it is what it is. My son is forever saying that. And that frustrates me. It's not indifference. It is what it is. But it's also not a short temper or a short fuse. It's that thing in between. Aristotle said the gentle or meek person is praised for being angry under the right circumstances with the right people in the right manner at the right time and for the right length of time. Meekness is power under control. It has a tough side. It doesn't back away from sin. It doesn't cease to condemn evil. It is anger under God's control. And it is as a meek person submits themselves to God as his instrument Where's my glove? His instrument. <laughs> his instrument. Okay, as we submit to God as his instrument, we will become angry about the things that offend God, not the things that offend us. Because we know that in humility, we, we are nothing before God. God is dis when God is dishonored, meekness is angry for the right reasons and for the right amount of time, in the right way, etc. 
Power under God's control reacts when it must react for the right reasons and for the right length of time. And who is our ultimate model of meekness? <laughs> Jesus. This is what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Paul says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. And then, he, and then Jesus himself says, I am meek and humble in heart. He is our great example here. He never spoke a word of retaliation or condemnation against anybody for something that they did to him. But he did speak up for the honor of his father, didn't he? Do you remember when his, his father was dishonored by the money changers in the temple? Buying and selling, turning his father's house into a market? What did he do? His righteous anger was there to throw them out, to cleanse the temple. And Jesus confronted the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees who were, who were leading people astray, who were making them sons of hell. And Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. He was angry for the right reason when God's honor was at stake. But when he was himself dishonored, 1 Peter 2 says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. So he was totally in innocent. We are never totally innocent. He was. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, and yes, the humility, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So you see, when it was himself and his own honor, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When it was his father's house and his father's glory and his father's honor at stake, he chased out the money changers and he called a spade a spade. That's meekness. It is total selflessness. Not reacting to personal dishonor, but dishonor to the Father. When the Jewish leaders and Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember what he said? I can call 12 legions of angels right now if I wanted to. <laughs> Why didn't he? He says in Matthew 26, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say that it must happen in this way? You see, he's, he's totally surrendered to the will of his father. In John chapter 18, again, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, Peter was anything but meek. Peter was more like me. Or shall I say, I was more like Peter. What does he do? <laughs> you dare come near my master, I'll take your ear off. That's kind of, that's my default setting. And, and what does Jesus say? Put your sword away. And he heals the ear of the servant of the high priest. And then he says, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? You see, total submission that we just disconnect again. Let's just quickly connect again. <clears throat> total submission to his Father's will. There we go. That's meekness. Jesus' meekness led him to make a whip to defend God against those who dishonored his name, but it led him to not seek vengeance for dishonor against himself. Now, obviously, we are tempted often to strike back when something happens to us. We need to remind ourselves not to get angry and to remember that what your neighbor does to you doesn't really matter because you don't matter <laughs> in the sense that you are just God's servant. And if you are in his hands and submit, sub, totally submitted to his will for your life, you don't need to defend yourself. You can entrust yourself to your father who will defend you. Right, what is the evidence of meekness? Why are we not getting there? The evidence of meekness. How do you know you're meek? Here are some practical questions to ask yourself. 
and I'm asking myself. So when I say do you, I'm saying do you, all of us. Do you experience firstly self-control? Is your anger under control? Do you rule your spirit or does your temper often flare up? And you know where the rubber hits the road is in our, in our families. When your spouse says something to you that could start an argument, do you immediately defend yourself like Peter? <laughs> or do you give way and listen quietly without trying to mount up all the counter arguments about why you are right and why he's wrong? Do you experience self-control? Are you angry only when God is dishonored? The things that should make you angry should be the things that dishonor God, that mar his reputation, that despise his name. Do you get angry about sin? Do you get angry about God's word being perverted by false doctrine or by false teachers or being uh, misquoted? 2 Timothy 2 verse 25, um, Paul says to Timothy that we should gently exhort those who oppose us. He says those who oppose him, he must gently instruct, meekly, in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. So if they oppose us, we instruct them gently. But we ought to be righteously angry, expressed in a godly way, by the way. When we say righteously angry, we don't just mean you flip your lid. Okay, Expressed in a godly way, when God is dishonored. So are you angry when God is dishonored? Do you respond humbly to God's word? James 1 verse 21 says that we are to receive with meekness, with meekness or humbly accept the word planted in you which is able to save you. Do you submit meekly to the word of God no matter what it says to you? When you are challenged by God's word through the preaching and teaching ministry of the church, do you submit meekly to that word? Do you say, God, transform me, change me? Or are you what one lady once called a skopgraaf christen? You know what the skopgraaf christen is in Afrikaans? It's the, the, the one who takes the skopgraaf, that's a spade, and goes, this is for my husband. I hope he heard what the pastor said. This is for my son. This is for my daughter. This is for so and so. I hope she heard what the pastor said. And, and we never take the word of God and say, well, God, what are you saying to me? What, is, what are you showing me is wrong in my heart? What must I submit to? Do you always seek to make peace? Because meek people are peacemakers. In fact, Remember, humility leads to meekness, which leads to patience, which leads to love, which leads to uh, Ephesians 4 verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Peace, you see. Meek people don't start fights. They end them. When someone falls into sin, do you condemn them or gossip about them? Or do you practice Galatians 6.1? Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, meekly, knowing that you too are a sinner. Do you accept criticism without retaliation? Mm. That's a hard one for us perfectionists. Whether criticism is right or wrong, we should accept it without retaliating. We need to thank God for it. And then we need to take that criticism and squeeze every ounce of truth, even if it's only a little drop of truth out of it, that may be in that criticism there for your good. Even if, it's, even if the criticism is totally untrue, you can still squeeze this ounce of truth out of it that God is using it to humble you. Remember, you are humbling in God's hand. And therefore we accept from his hand all things for our good. Spurgeon, good old C.H. Spurgeon said, Brother, if anyone thinks ill of you, don't be angry with him, for you are worse than he thinks you are. <laughs> In other words, 
when someone criticizes us, our first response should be, yeah, you're right. And you don't even know the half of it. <laughs> if you really knew me, you'd know I'm even twice as bad as that. But then we need to say it genuinely and not just to make that person feel bad. And then lastly, do you have the right attitude towards non-Christians? Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, we should be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us to give a reason for the hope that we have, but to do it with gentleness or meekness and respect. You know, sometimes Christians have this, have, have this horrible attitude to people in the world. You know, we can look down on non-Christians and sort of, well, at least I'm not like that. And, and then we forget that actually we're in the same position, but for the grace of God. We would be in, do you really believe that? I shudder to think where I would be today if God had not reached into my life at age 15. Because I know I was on a path headed for disaster. The people out there are not the enemy, to use John MacArthur's words. They are on a mission field. So speak to them with meekness. Tell them about your hope with meekness and respect. All right. That's meekness. Whew, quickly, patience. Patience, long-suffering. What's the meaning of patience? Well, humility leads to meekness, which leads to patience. And that word, the Greek word translated patience, macrothumia, just means long-suffering. In other words, to suffer long. Long-tempered. In other words, you don't have a short fuse. You don't lose your temper. Patience is meekness applied. It's the spirit that doesn't retaliate, that bears the difficulties or the hardship or the trials or the insults or the injury or the persecution or the unfair treatment or the slander or the criticism or the hatred or the jealousy or the envy. It bears it. Whenever, whatever circumstances or people throw at them, patient people accept it without bitterness or complaint. And there's always three elements to patience. It is enduring negative circumstances, first of all. You've heard of the saying, oh, she's got the patience of Job. Well, you know, it comes from the Bible. Because of the way that he endured patiently his difficult circumstances. James chapter 5 says, Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, as you know, we consider blessed those who persevered. And you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So there's patience involves enduring difficult circumstances firstly. Think of Paul in the New Testament. Do you know what he was patiently willing to endure? Prison, hardship, hardship. I mean, 2 Corinthians 11, if you want to know about Paul's hardship, for the sake of the gospel. He was willing to endure all things for the sake of the elect, he says in 2 Timothy 2.10. So that's circumstances. But it's also coping with difficult people. And often we can endure the circumstances a little bit better when it comes to patience than <laughs> difficult people. Macrothemia is used in the Bible to speak of patience with people as well as with circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says, be patient with everyone. When you come into contact with a truly patient person, you can't start a fight with them, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> you have to live in peace with them. Now, our normal reaction, isn't it, is to be defensive when we're provoked, especially in our families. You know, we can put that, that stuff up a lip out there in the, in the world or with other people, but whoa, when it's hubby or it's that insolent teenager, that cocky teenager, or that defiant little two-year-old, it's not so easy. But what does it communicate when we're defensive? like that. It communicates who is really important to us. That we are important. And what we do is important. Whereas the thing that is important is to defend God and not ourselves. 
The patient person does what Paul tells us in Romans 12, 19 to 21. Again, he knows that he can trust himself to God. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Therefore, we repay evil with good. And so we heap coals of fire on the head of the person. But we don't defend ourselves. We don't take vengeance or revenge ourselves. And then thirdly, it is also accepting God's plan for everything. And that means trusting his providence. Trusting that whatever he allows in our lives, he allows for our good. It doesn't argue with God's plan or question circumstances or people or God. A long-suffering person says, Lord, if this is what you have planned for me, give me the grace, but I want to obey you. I want to do what Jesus did. I want to accept the cup from your hand and drink it. Trusting your wisdom, trusting your love in this providence which you've allowed in my life. Trusting, as John Piper says, that God is up to something good in all of my delays and detours and obstacles and difficulties. Patient people, as the hymn says, do not judge the Lord by feeble sense. They trust him for his grace and they know that behind a frowning providence, God hides a smiling face. He's up to something good. Who's our model again, ladies? Who's our perfect model of patience? Our Lord Jesus. Did he endure negative circumstances? Not one of us can ever say that we've had to resist to the point of shedding our blood like that. He chose to leave the perfect environment of heaven where his name was always praised. To come into this world where people rejected him, cursed him and ultimately crucified him. And he endured it for our sake. He didn't have a home of his own. He often became weary and tired. He knew what it was to be hungry, but he endured it patiently. And he coped with difficult people. <laughs> no, I thought I had those up. Can you imagine how patient Jesus must have been to deal with those 12 disciples? Oi, oi, oi. Peter, James and John, the top three. James and John were just wanting to call down thunder from heaven and lightning to strike down everybody. And Peter, well, you know, he just, well, you can't go to the cross and die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And, and he's about to go to the cross. And what are they doing? Arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. I mean, can you imagine the patience Jesus must have had with those 12 knuckleheads? They just didn't learn the lessons. And then he, he's hanging on the cross, bearing our sin. People are spitting in his face. They're mocking him. And what does he say? Father, forgive him, for they do not know what they are doing. And remember, the people God forgives end up in heaven. <laughs> so he's praying that God will forgive them so that they end up in heaven with him. The people who are mocking him, the people who are spitting on him. And then obviously we know that Jesus, man, Carol, it's not on there. Jesus accepted God's plan for everything, didn't he? Again, my father, if it is possible, take this cup away from me, but not my will, your will be done. He endured unimaginable suffering because he knew it was God's will and he humbly surrendered, it, surrendered to it. So Jesus is the ultimately humble one, meek one patient one. The one who made the world. The one who formed the galaxies in space. The one from our, our Isaiah lessons. How do you remember Isaiah chapter 40? The one who calls every star by name. And because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. The one who preserves innumerable orbits of planets. The one who weighs the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance. The one who holds all the waters in the hollow of his hands and before whom all the inhabitants are like grasshoppers. This one is humble and meek and patient and lowly. So can we, who are just dust, and nothing before God, can we not be a little more humble and patient and meek? 
This is Jesus' invitation to us tonight. At last, we get to that verse. Come to me. Come to me. You who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. How? Bend your neck to the yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle or meek and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know a yoke? It was made of wood. Handmade to fit the neck and shoulders of the particular animal that was going to wear it so that it wouldn't chafe and, and, and hurt the neck of that animal. Now for obvious reasons, the yoke then became a metaphor for submission. You can see why. The yoke is part of the harness that is used to pull a cart or a plow or a, or a mill beam. You know, uh, the, the, the millstones that grind the wheat, that donkey or cow or whatever that walks around. It was the means by which the animal's master kept it under control and guided it to useful work. Power under control. It was by means of the yoke that the animal became a useful instrument in the hands of the master. Do you long to be meek and patient and humble and therefore restful? Then you have to be humble. You have to lower your neck. You have to embrace that yoke of Jesus. And I'm telling you again this evening, I think that means not so much the yoke he imposes on you, but the yoke he wore, the same yoke, the yoke of submission to his Father's will. Are you willing to embrace that yoke with a willing, willing, voluntary submission and learn from him whose delight was to do his Father's will? And remember, a yoke always involved two animals pulling. It was to keep the animals moving in step with each other. And so what Jesus is saying here is, come and join me. I've got my head under the yoke. I had my head under the yoke of submission to the Father. Come and join me. Bend your neck to the same yoke and keep in step with me. Walk with me. Walk the same walk. Does that sound like adding another burden tonight to your already overloaded back? I hope it doesn't come across that way this evening. It can, if you're already weary and burdened. And I say to you, take the yoke of Jesus upon you. It can sound like, oh, no, not another burden, not another thing for me to, to submit to. <coughs> but you know, if you feel that way, it is because of your pride. It's because we're striving against God's will and trying to do things in our own strength that we are being worn down. That's really what weighs us down. Jesus says here, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And he says that it will bring us rest. Submitting to God's will and living in dependence on him under his yoke is in actual fact the only true road to rest. Because that's when we, we become what we were created to be. Which is empty vessels, tools, through which the glory of our Master can shine, unhindered. That's why Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That word easy, Christos, means gracious. In other words, it's his grace to us. That yoke is his grace to us. There is nothing in it that will irritate the neck that yields to it. Nothing to hurt that neck, but rather to refresh it. Christ's yoke is lined with love, and he says it is light. Not light, light, not heavy. Remember that old hymn quoted it last week? But this is the point. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. We must get away from this idea in our minds that humility, meekness, humbleness, 
bending our heads to the yoke of Jesus is, oh, such a burden. <laughs> it's not. Jesus says it's the road to true freedom, to true blessing. And it is of great worth in God's sight. 1 Peter chapter 3 says that the right, the, the kind of clothing we as women should wear should be that of our inner selves, the unfailing beauty of a gentle or meek, it's the same word, and quiet spirit. Quiet here yeah, doesn't mean, you know, I never say anything. It means meekness. It means humility, quietness, humbleness. A meek and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. My Bible says it nicer. Which is precious in the sight of God. Precious in the sight of God. Oh, may we all be so clothed. What a challenge tonight. You know, we were singing this song on Sunday. Oh, and, I'm, and I knew what was coming for Tuesday. And I just thought, can I really, Carol, can you really sing these words and mean them? Oh, Father, use my ransomed life. In any way you choose. I think a 17, 18 year old me would have said yes. <laughs> now an almost 52 year old me is saying, can I really say that and mean it? Let's close, and I'm just going to close with a prayer of Betty Scott Stam, a missionary with a China Inland mission who actually was martyred for her faith. Lord, I give up all my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes, and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my time, my all, utterly to thee, to be thine forever. Fill me and seal me with your Holy Spirit. Use me as you will. Send me where you want. Work out your whole will in my life. At any cost, now and forever. May my life, Lord, be a channel, an unblocked channel, through which your glory can be displayed. In Jesus' name, Amen.